there's a few encyclicals written about St. Francis. Uh, it, they, they wrote a lot about St. Francis, especially the Third Order, but it was uh, Leo the Thirteenth, Benedict the Fifteenth, and um, Pius the Eleventh. They wrote some beautiful encyclicals on on St. Francis. And in those in those uh, encyclicals, they refer to as they say in St. Paul to be imitators of me. That's Philippians three uh, seventeen. So, so in St. Francis, they referred to St. Francis as the risen Lord in his own lifetime, referred to him as the risen Lord, another Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the holy pontiffs were referring to St. Francis by way of imitate him because he was the, the vir catholicus et apostolicus. He was the Catholic and apostolic man. That's magnificent to hear because St. Francis was, in, was given by Our Lady. He was... He was imbued by Our Lady. He prayed that she would take him as his advocate, that, 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 Saint, that Our Lady would be his advocate. And in doing so, when she responded, I mean, when she answered his prayer, it says St. Bonaventure says in chapter three of the, the, the major life, mm -hmm. he says that Our Lady conceived in St. Francis the gospel way of life. Wow. Way of life. That, that means that the perfect way of imitating Christ, that, that was what he was imbued with. And then Our Lady brought it to, to, to fruition. She gave, she gave birth, as it were, to this, this Franciscan way of life, which is the gospel way of life, to live just like our dear blessed Lord on earth. And when St. Francis even went to, uh, when he went to the Vatican to talk to the Pope about it, they were like, you can't, you can't do that. It's, no man can really live that way. It's too much. And the cardinals went up and said, excuse me, but if, if you're going to say that, if you're going to say that it's too much to live the gospel, then we have to say the apostles didn't do it either. And we have to deny scripture. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, yeah, it's good. that's a good point. That's a good point. So then they gave permission for the life, and it revolutionized, not revolu revolutionized in the opposite sense. Right, right. It, it brought everyone to their senses to, to a time where there was great effeminacy. We don't realize it, but at that time, there was great affluency. There was, there was peace for the most part. People had luxury. It was very much, according to Leo XIII, if he has any authority whatsoever, and according to Benedict XV and Pius XI, they all say the time that St. Francis lived in is very similar to our time. That, uh, that affluency, with that luxury that they had. I mean, St. Francis was walking around before he was St. Francis. He was walking around in fine garments, fine clothing. He liked luxury. He was treating his friends to great banquets. You know, they, they didn't work a whole lot. He was a good salesman, but they didn't work a whole lot. They were always going out eating and feasting and dressing up well and, you know, living the high life. But the, the popes, they, they point us in the direction of imitating St. Francis. Mm -hmm. Is that imitation? The imitation of Saint Francis is perfect imitation of our dear blessed Lord, and that through reading the scriptures, for following the scriptures, for implementing the scriptures. And the thing that dawned on Saint Francis was, well, let's look at let's look at our dear blessed Lord. How did he live? He lived. He was born into nothing. The only the treasure that he took, the treasure that he took was his mother. He prepared the greatest treasure, the greatest throne, and that became his entry into the world and his mother, his greatest treasure, the Immaculate. That was the only treasure he took. And then he added to that treasury the beauty of St. Joseph, mm -hmm. a virtuous man. But you look at St. Joseph. St. Joseph, like, let's look at St. Joseph and the way St. Joseph lived manliness and the way an American does it. St. Joseph worked as a carpenter, and Mary of Agreda and other, other great uh, mystics refer to St. Joseph as that he, he worked in a way where he, he didn't ever charge anybody for his labor. What he would do is he would, he would take the commission or whatever it was, he would build the table or whatever he's supposed to build, and then he would, he would give them the table and he would leave it to them to pay it out of justice. And you can imagine people took advantage of it. And he didn't do anything. So they lived poor because St. Joseph was probably a very fine carpenter. But we know from scripture, he was considered a poor carpenter. 
they, they speak of him in kind of a disparaging way. Isn't he the son of the carpenter? But St. Joseph was a poor carpenter because he didn't charge people for what his work was worth. He believed and trusted in God's providence. And this is the way our Lord wanted to live. He lived a way to show us how we were to live. And then later he talks about it. They were to be like the birds, you know, the flowers of the field and the birds of the air. And we're to, to rely on our heavenly father. St. Francis wanted to be that. He wanted to be this butterfly that just didn't have anything or worry about anything because he believed his good father, our father in heaven, would provide for all of his needs. But then men today, instead of like what St. Joseph did, he, St. Joseph longed to go to work to sanctify himself. Then he looked for justice sake, pay me what you think it's worth. Men today want to do half the work of what it's worth. And they want to be, they want to be paid three, four times more because they want to have the nest egg. Want to go on vacation because they want to have a car that has all these, you know, everything in it. Cameras that show them all kinds of stuff when they're backing up. I don't. Know. But th- there's an eff- there's an effeminacy with it because what we long for, we just long to live this. We long for this life. Mm-hmm. Long to fill our life with things of this life. We 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 justify good Catholics justify being able to treat ourselves to stuff. I, you hear good Catholics go out to a restaurant, not in these days, but you know, normally you go out to a restaurant and they'll complain because they should have given me enough food to be able to take home. Or they'll get mad because the person didn't refill their soda 15 times yeah. or whichever part of the country you're listening. They, there's always some kind of complaint, you know, but you go over to the, you go over to like the Philippines or something like that. They, they make a bowl of rice for you and they put a dead fish on it and you that's what you eat. And you're like, this is great. You know, you put a little bit of salt on it and you eat your fish and your dead, you eat your dead fish and your, and your, and your rice over, over here. It's like, I paid $15. I expect, I expect a take home box. I, expect my, 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 I'm not going to leave that lady anything. Yep. Where's your charity? Good Christian soul. Yep. So we, we strive for the, the top of the top and all as we are really is birds with little, with little strings attached to our feet. What we do is we tie ourselves down to this world. So where's our virtue? It's virtue. And when we start growing in the virtue, we start detaching from everything that's of this world. And that's when we start preparing for heaven. People don't understand that. They think I have to live, be good, do my best, die and go to heaven, right? No, you're here. You are here to grow in virtue, which is imitation of Christ. Christ of the world and chose to be born in a stable. He didn't have any place to call his own. Then immediately they had to flee and go into Egypt, where St. Mary of Great even talks about the fact that, that our blessed, the Blessed Virgin would, would pray that the sun would beat on them more rigorously because they want to do penance. They wanted to make reparation for other people's sins. This is what we Christians should be doing, not worrying about how much money we're going to make so we can prove to people how blessed we are. That is constant mentality. Mm-hmm. Yes. If God wants to give us a lot of money in the job that we do, we do that job only for the love of God. We live poorly like the Holy family and we'll use our money to help the church. I love it. Or I actually hate it. When you hear Christians, good Christians, traditional Catholics who will complain about the vestments mm-hmm. and then ask them, have you ever bought any vestments for the, Parish, have you ever helped out? Have you ever thought to buy a linen, uh, donate some money to Father to get a, a nice linen for the altar for our Lord? Have you ever thought to donate and, and spend the money to get a better tabernacle? You know that, that everybody wants to complain it's and they easy. want to spend their money, but nobody wants to spend their money for our Lord. They all want to say, "But our Lord lived in poverty, so our, you know it's, it's wrong to have these churches." Now, traditional Catholics don't say that. But you still do get a lot of people who think it. You know, they're okay. It's okay for them to have a really big house. But it's not okay if the parish priest needs a million dollars to renovate, not renovate, but to even change the roof that's leaking. Mm-hmm. You know? It's easy to complain. It's hard to build. It's hard to do penance. It's easier to complain. And it, what it is, is it's, 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 our lack of, it's our lack of imitating our Lord. Mm-hmm. Imitating on the fact of how did he live his life? He went into a town. He had nowhere to even lay his head. You know, people, you know, the, the apostles were sent out two by two and they weren't allowed to take anything with them because they had to rely on the providence of God. We were afraid to rely on the providence of God. 
We think we have to provide for ourselves. And when we're provided well, we thank God's providence, which is really very sad because God, since he is all providential, meaning if he, if he stops providing for us at any moment, we wouldn't exist anymore. That's how he provides, how intimately he wants to provide for us. And it's one of the beauties that St. Francis gave to the world is that Franciscans, if they live authentically their vocation, they're to beg for their food. They rely on charity because they fulfill that blessing for people. Whatever you did for the least of my brethren, you did unto me so that they will never receive that curse that our Lord says in Matthew 25, that um, the power when the when our Lord comes back and he puts all the sheep and the goats on either side. So the way to grow in this manliness isn't, isn't to read each individual scripture and try to, you know, it's to read, it's to read all of scripture, understanding who is our dear blessed Lord and praying to our dear blessed Lord. How do you want me to, especially for the men, how do you want me to do my work? How do you want me to live with the family in, in austerity of some sort and use our money for the upbuilding of the faith, for the promulgation of the gospel? Now, maybe the families can't go out and evangelize. They have to evangelize with their lives. They, they may not be able to go to work and speak about, you know, go, go to the water cooler and just start talking about our Lord and whatever. Maybe it's not going to work in some people's work environment. Some people are able to do that. Some people might not be. But our, our baptismal and especially our confirmation grace gives us a special grace to be Christ in the world. But that's only noticeable through our virtues. Mm -hmm. Unless we're developing our virtues, living our virtues, then people start to see in us, there's something different about you because they see Christ. Mm -hmm. They see you imitating Christ. And then they ask you, and then you make a response. So that's just one little aspect. But the point is, is to, to start living according to the life of our Lord, seeing how he lived, seeing how he died. He didn't have anything. In the end, he, he died with nothing. In his, in his journeys, he had nothing. He sat down and asked that woman at the well, give me to drink. He, and he was tired. Mm -hmm. When he fell asleep, when he fell asleep in the boat, you remember there's a storm? Mm -hmm. Why did he fall asleep? Because he was just playing around. See, we don't sort out the fact that he would stay up at nighttime. Mm -hmm. He would do battle with his own flesh, even though he had no concupiscence. This is what we, he's showing us what we're supposed to be doing. We have concupiscence. What it means is we have disordered attachment or inclinations towards sin, mm -hmm. towards, uh, towards our passions, right? Well, we have to do battle with that. So we have our flesh and we have our spirit. The way we start growing in these virtues is we see the flesh desires to have my Coca-Cola refilled 15 times while I'm there because I want to get the most out of my $1.50. I want to have the biggest burger I can get. And I, I, I have a yearning for a hamburger today. And so I'm going to go to this one restaurant that I've been thinking about for a couple of days. And I'm going to satisfy that yearning, right? That's the, from the flesh. The more the flesh asks us to do things, the more the flesh says, just hit the alarm button and go back to sleep for a couple more minutes. Mm -hmm. just, just snap at that person because you need to show them that they shouldn't be talking to you that way. The flesh tells us what we should do, but now we, we know in our intellect, because we study it, because we pray about it, because we reflect on it, what would be the virtuous thing to do? And then it, with our will, we have to now make a decision. What am I going to do? Am I going to have, am I going to have 15 Coca-Colas at this meeting at lunch? Do I really have to go to that restaurant or can I eat the peanut butter and jelly sandwich that I packed? Am I going to snap at that person or am I just going to, I'm going to force myself to stay silent, even though it feels like martyrdom saying something to that employee or, or co-worker. That's the fight, that, that rage that you feel, that, that, that wanting to eat the hamburger instead eating your peanut butter and jelly, the not saying the thing to your co-worker instead remaining silent, that death that you feel inside, it is that dying to self. And this is where the battle between the flesh and the spirit comes in. Unless we do the battle between the flesh and the spirit, you will never become an image of Christ. And that's what manliness is. One who can dominate his flesh. Now, man, meaning a human being, 
has the ability, an intellectual creature, has the, has the ability to run until he dies. Even though he can't anymore, he can say, I'm going anyways. He can, he can, he can not eat until he dies. He can decide not to eat again. Animals can't do that. They don't eat because they have a dysfunction. They won't run until they die unless you force them. We can do it. We can choose to do certain. I'm not saying not don't eat until you die. What I'm saying is we have the ability to overcome the flesh. And if we don't overcome the flesh, we will not make it to heaven. One thing dominates in this world. And whatever dominates is your eternity. Your soul either dominates your flesh or your flesh dominates your spirit. If your flesh dominates your spirit, hell will be yours for eternity and your spirit will be dominated by the flesh for all eternity. It'll be immovable in hell, right? Tormented. Whereas if your spirit dominates your flesh, like St. Francis strove to do with his every breath, what St. Paul did with his every breath, what our Lord shows us, though he didn't have to dominate his flesh, he showed us, he shows us in his vigils, in his fasts, walking until he's exhausted and the falling asleep in the middle of a storm and just waking up and be like, what's everybody worried about? But all, all of this, he's showing us how we're supposed to dominate these things so that our resurrection is like his resurrection. That's why the body is glorified afterwards because it's dominated by the soul. But that's what your life is. When you look at the very end of what life is, the very end of what life is, did you, did the soul win the battle or did the flesh win the battle? Will you be forever in eternity dominated by the flesh or will your spirit dominate your flesh? Will your, will your flesh participate in the glory of heaven?